Welcome everyone to Driven by Cause, the show where we find out what drives some of the most brightest minds in the nonprofit industry. I want to take a quick second and I want to give a shout out to our fantastic sponsors, Ariva and Meistersoft. Thank you very much. I'm joined by my fantastic co-host, Jay Fisk. Jay, how are you doing today? Hi, David. Good morning. I am doing great. Thank you. Let's get uh, started with this thing. Jay, you know what? I'm ready to. Hey, let's get right into it. I'm excited to introduce our guest. She is an amazing influence in the nonprofit industry for years. She's such a prolific philanthropist, but most importantly, she's one of the most humble, generous, thoughtful people I know, and one of my business partners. Welcome, Susan Packard Orr. Um, thank you for being here today, Susan. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks for having me. We're, we're so happy that you're here. Susan, you're known as a philanthropist. Can you share what that word means to you? Well, for I think for a lot of people, the word philanthropist, when you say philanthropist, you, you picture some rich person who's, you know, giving a lot of money away out there, you know, Bill Gates or somebody like that. We, we think of it as money, but it isn't just money, of course. It's giving time. It's being just being kind to your neighbor. Um, all those ways that, that we show love of mankind, which is what the word means. Susan, you've spent all your adult life involved with the nonprofit sector. I can't imagine how much you've seen. Looking back on all of it, can you share with the audience what has touched you the most? Well, of course, it's the people who are doing the work. And I, I've just been so privileged because I've had experiences like, like going to India and going to a small village and meeting these beautiful young women who work as midwives. And midwives in India, because they deal with bodily fluids, are considered the lowest caste. And I've been to Ethiopia and gone to schools where the girls are just trying so hard to stay in school under all kinds of very difficult circumstances. And of course, the Ronald McDonald House. And I have such admiration for people who work at Ronald McDonald Houses because, you know, those houses have provide a, a home away from home for families whose children are in the hospital. And if your child's in the hospital, your child is really sick. And the, the staff people who work in, in Ronald McDonald Houses, they, they're just angels. They take care of these families who are in such crisis. You, know, you, you have a, a lifetime of it experience with nonprofits, uh, literally raised in the nonprofit world uh, with the experience you've had with your family. Is there anything you would change about the nonprofit space? One of the big challenges in the nonprofit sector is it's very hard to measure effectiveness. You know, let's say you want to work on the homeless problem and you look around at the, all the nonprofits and you want to know which one, which ones deserve your investment. And so what's happened over time is people have grasped at easy measurements for example, nonprofits all have to publish their tax returns, their 990s, and in that they have to include their overhead rates. So how much money they spend on direct service actually helping their clients versus how much money they spend on their infrastructure. And in particular, they have to reveal how much, what percentage they spend on fundraising. And then Charity Navigator and these other rating agencies come along and, and because not because this is a good measure of effectiveness, but because this is something you can measure. <laughs> These nonprofits get judged by this, you know, get stars based on how little they spend on infrastructure, which, which I think is just nuts because they, that means they're just constantly cutting back on the money that they need to invest so they can do a better job. There's a very interesting book about this called Uncharitable. And it's written by a man named Adon Pallotta, P-A-L-L-O-T-T-A. -T -T this is one thing I, I would really change, change the way nonprofits are judged. You, you got to be able to spend some money to make some money. If you're, in a, if you're a nonprofit, you have to build the infrastructure so you can raise even more money, right? Is there a cause or issue that's near and dear to your heart or just one you're aware of that uh, you don't think gets enough love? Absolutely. I, I think that climate change is the, is the number one threat to mankind and all the other animals and plants we share the earth with. It needs everybody's attention at, at all levels, and, and it, it isn't getting it. But on the other hand, it affects us all. I mean, it it's, you know, it's not, it's, it's not just, uh, you know, segmented people with cancer or people with other issues, or whatever it's, we are, we are the planet. Susan, more than my understanding, I know how active you are as a volunteer in fundraising. Can you speak, you know, to the audience more about how you get involved or how you would like others to get involved? 
Yeah, well, I'll start with the story about my first fundraising effort. So when I was a student in college, there was a, a children's hospital nearby. And every, every year there was a con home week and different student groups had a competition to see how much money they could raise. So our women's dorm, the floor in our women's dorm had this idea for how we would raise money. And we thought, you know, we'll go into the boys' dorms and the fraternities and stuff. And if they leave 50 cents or something on the sheets, we'll, we'll put the clean sheets on the bed for them. And that's how we're going to raise money. <laughs> and I, I'm telling you, changing sheets for 18-year-old boys <laughs> is not a good way to make money. <laughs> so I, I kind of learned my lesson on that one. Um, so that was my first foray. But, you know, some, some years later, quite a few years later, I was on a board of a children's, uh, something called the Children's Health Council here. And, and they were uh, starting to campaign. And they brought in a wonderful consultant, a woman named Kay Sprinkle Grace. And she took us through some training and had us talk about why we think people give money to organizations. And we came up with a lot of reasons, but the main reason why people give is because somebody asked them to. The way not to do it is to go out on the golf course with your buddies and say, you know, I'm working on this campaign. And if you give $1,000 to this, I'll give $1,000 to your favorite charity, you know, tit for tat. Which, that's not what you want to do. What you want to do is you want to identify people who really fall in love with your cause and become not just donors to the campaign, but become lifetime donors to, to the organization. And I have experienced that. I've done a lot of work with the Children's Hospital. And it's just really wonderful when you see that. When you bring somebody in who doesn't know much about the hospital and you take them on a tour and suddenly it's their favorite cause too. Well, that sort of leads a little bit more into my next question. When you're working with great capital campaigns, and, and again, it's that belief, what have you seen that has made those capital campaigns successful? And what have you learned that you would share with the audience to avoid? So I'm going to talk about um, a, a really big capital campaign and set to raise $500 million. This was for the Children's Hospital. And be before we got started on this, the Children's Hospital had been raising about $3 million a year. And in a good year, maybe they'd get $6 million because they had a bequest come in or a couple of bequests come in. And what we did was we spun out a separate foundation. We hired a guy to run it who came out of Stanford University. Now, Stanford University typically raises more money than any other institution in America year after year. My first call with him, he knew this couple who were giving to Stanford. They'd only given $100,000 to the hospital in all their history with the hospital. And he said, we're going to go have lunch with them. I've sent them two proposals, one for $8 million and one for $10 million. <laughs> wow. And I, I just said, you know, why on earth do you think these people are going to give this money? And he said, oh, they will. You'll see. So we went to lunch, you know, sure enough, they ended up giving us $8 million. And that first year that we had Stephen running this, the show, you know, we raised $17 million. Mm. And the next year we raised $25 million. And we eventually hit our $500 million goal. And then we did it again. We did another campaign of $500 million and raised it again. It's just a matter of having the right people in place who know how to do this. So you do the research, you get to know the donors, you follow what they want to do. So you really have to do your research and understand what motivates people. Yeah. You sit on a lot of nonprofit boards. Um, what have you seen? How does, whether it's the executive director, the director of development, get board members to become more active fundraisers? What have you seen that really works? Because I always hear they're struggling. How do I get my board members active? Well, the, the very first thing you need to do is you need to set expectations with your board. So you need to write a board job description. And in that board job description, you need to say something about how they should make an annual gift themselves, but also mm -hmm. how they should help you I mean, you don't have to detail exactly how, but you should make it clear that one of the expectations of board members is to help with fundraising. So just to yeah. set that up as an expectation, first, first of all. And then second of all, you, you don't want to scare people off because they're, they're definitely people who are really uncomfortable with fundraising. You know, the idea of asking somebody else for money is just terrifying. When you ask somebody for money, it, you're not begging 
you know, you don't have out your tin cup. You know, what, what you're doing is you're offering them an opportunity to invest in a cause that will make a difference in the world. But the, the places I've seen that are successful with getting the board involved is they offer lots and lots of different ways to be involved. It doesn't mean that you have to ask for money. If you're uncomfortable asking for money, that's fine. You don't have to ask for money, but you can do some other things that you are comfortable with. For example, you can invite people that you think have capacity or might be interested to come sit at your table at the auction gala dinner that you're putting on, or you can offer to have a, a small event in your home. If that's too hard, you can ask people to add notes onto solicitation letters, you know, just a personal note on the bottom. You know, one of the boards I'm on sits down with each of us at the beginning of the year and we make a plan. Each individual board member has an annual plan for what we're going to do during the year that's related to fundraising, what we personally are going to do. David mentioned that you sit on a lot of boards, and one of those boards that you sit on is the National Audubon Society. For those who may not be familiar with the National Audubon Society, tell us a little bit about it. Well, it's just a bunch of nerdy birders, right? <laughs> no, it's the National Audubon Society. I think most people probably know it has to do with birds. Uh, but the thing about birds is that birds tell us what's happening in the larger environment. You know, they're, they're the canary in the coal mine, but... Uh, writ large out in the world. So yeah. if you pay attention to what's happening to birds, you can really see what's happening in your, in your own ecosystems. You know, with climate change coming, there's going to be some huge extinctions of birds, which is mm. just a real tragedy. About 40% of the species of birds in North America actually spend more time outside the United States than they spend in the United States because they make these massive migrations, mostly down to Latin America. I'm lucky in my life. I crash across the street from my office. I have on top of a telephone pole, I have a California uh, osprey nest. So if someone does some research on you online, they're going to find an awful lot of information about you out there. Of course, it's a public figure that you are. What's something that people would find surprising if they knew a little bit more about Susan? <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know how surprising this would be, but, but, um, I just love doing puzzles. And so every day I do the New York Times crossword puzzle. My husband and I do the spelling bee. Now this wonderful Wordle. Do you know about Wordle? <laughs> it's, it's a fun thing to do every day. And I think it, it's the same kind of mind that you have when you're a computer programmer, which I used to be too. So. Yeah, you, you, this has been fascinating. You've shared so much about, uh, so much insight about you. We sure appreciate that. One of the favorite questions I always like to ask people when I'm interviewing you is, what question didn't I ask you that, that you wish I had? Well, you didn't ask me what I missed the most about uh, during the pandemic. Which okay, is... so what did you miss most? <laughs> <laughs> what, what did you miss uh, most? I mean, we all missed a lot of things. <laughs> what I missed most about uh, during the pandemic was traveling. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I just love to travel. And if I look back over, I keep a little journal, not with any detail, but just I write down the trips. But I think this, this last two years must be the first time in maybe 30 years when I haven't been outside the United States. Oh. And oh. I just really miss that. Yeah, I think a lot of people feel the same way, Susan. Um, so... Susan, we can't thank you enough for your time today. I mean, yeah. it has been amazing. We're going to pause for a few minutes and we're going to break and then uh, we'll come right back to you. We are a team that has had an enduring influence on the nonprofit industry for more than three decades. We pride ourselves on developing and delivering technology with a purpose. Software born of a genuine understanding and passion for cause. We are relentlessly dedicated to our client's success. We are with our clients. For good. We are Ariva, tech with purpose, driven by cause. Ariva is the trusted advisor and market leader of fundraising, donor relationship management, and auction software and services. Exceed further, our evolutionary all-in-one digital fundraising and donor relationship management software is helping nonprofits worldwide further their mission, transform fundraising, and cultivate relationships with donors and constituents. Our Maestro Auction virtual, live, and silent auction software, text to bid virtual and mobile bidding software, and text-to-fund, text-based donation software 
are helping nonprofits raise billions of dollars through thousands of virtual fundraising events, charity auctions, and galas. Visit Ariva.com and reach out today and see how Ariva can help your nonprofit organization go further. So welcome back, guys. All right, we're going to go into our next segment. Jay, why don't you tell them what time it is? David, it is time for Ask the Maestro. This is uh, where we get a chance to answer a question from our audience. They can ask you anything, Jay? Well, to a degree, if they you know, want cooking tips or something like that, uh, I may not be able to give them, give them much of that, but something that might relate to the nonprofit industry, you know, be appropriate. So our first question comes from Robert, and he says, I work with a small nonprofit in upstate New York. Every year, we host an annual event where we feature different local restaurants and also host an auction at the end. The event takes place in November. It used to be extremely popular each year. The turnout is getting smaller and smaller. We thought it may be due to COVID, but we're not seeing the engagement. Do you have any tips on how to make any event more successful? Any event, whether it's a restaurant tasting event or whether it is a golf tournament, a traditional gala, any kind of event like that should utilize what I call peer-to-peer audience development. Meaning that if you're just inviting people and they think that the reason they're coming is to eat the food, they're not there for the right motivation. They need to be there for the cause. And the way you get them there for the cause is by making sure that those people that are most closely aligned with the cause are doing the inviting. So you want to start with taking your core people, your, and Susan mentioned it before, the board. You start with the board. The board is your first line of defense on getting people to an event. They're the ones that should be doing the inviting. Jay, I hope that answers the question for Robert, and I really thank you for that um, answer. That was really fantastic. So Jay, this question comes from Merrill, and she says, Hi, Driven by Cause crew. When I created a peer-to-peer fundraising page, I feel like I'm giving my entire database away. Is there a way on peer-to-peer that I can put my entire database in without anyone else seeing it? I've heard this a number of times of, I don't want to give my email list out to my, you know, nonprofit organization. I don't mind if they give, that's okay. And then they can have their email address. And then I hope they create best practices, but my fear is always, how are they going to see it? And, and the answer is they should not. So there's a lot of different ways. And I, you know, there's software out there that does great peer to peer, you know, Ariva is one of our sponsors. They have an amazing way of doing this. And the simplest way or the two simplest ways I would share it with you is you create your own page that's connected to the organization. And either you can put your first name in and then you do a blind copy Uh, or a copy to you and you blind copy all the email addresses so the organization does not see it. Now, if somebody does give a, give a donation or they register for an event that you're promoting, then they're going to give that. And you want that anyways. The second way is there should be a shared button that makes it very simple on your peer to peer fundraising page after you create it. And that shared button should allow you to put all of your email addresses whether it's five people or 500 people, it shouldn't be matter to you. And those people will only be, again, seen by the organization once they give a donation. So that's the simplest answer. Great answer, David. And I'm sad to say we are at the end of our time for today's show. We do want you to submit your Ask the Maestro. You can go to ariva.com. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. Jay, thank you so much. Susan, it was a pleasure having you with us today. It was such a real treat. I mean, this was truly amazing for Jay, myself, and I know for the audience. And while we're at it, make sure you go ahead and hit the subscribe button not to miss out on any of the Driven by Cause. I also want to give you a thank you to our amazing sponsors, Ariva and Microsoft, for their support and for allowing us to be here with all of you today. Thank you to all of our fantastic listeners. We hope you'll join us next time on Driven by Cause. Make it a great day.